This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Yes, you, the listener right there. Thanks to all of you, including Scott Hepburn, Jeff Wilkes, and Paley Glendale. Coming up on DTNS, Shannon Morse is here to talk about the difference between getting your multi-factor authentication from an app versus a physical key. Plus, Instagram might start a Mastodon server, and the bank that serves half of the U.S. tech world closed down. I'm sure it's fine, though. It's fine. It's going to be fine. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, the 10th of March, 2023. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chin. Happy Mario Day to those of you who celebrate. Oh, yes, happy Ooh, Mario Day to all. Yeah, it's it's a you. It's, it's a Mario me, Day. Chris Pratt. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Uh, let's move on from that to the quick hits. Here we go. Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo reports that Apple plans to launch a redesigned HomePod in the first half of 2024 featuring a 7-inch display. So like an Echo Show, but from Apple. Kuo says that China's Tianma products would be hired to build the smart display. Sony rolled out Discord voice chat support for PlayStation 5 following Microsoft's Xbox, which got Discord support last fall. So now they both have it. Your move, Nintendo Switch. It's Mario Day. Come on. Uh, speaking of Discord, it's launching an alpha test, not a beta test, an alpha test of using chat GPT in Clyde, the chatbot, starting next week. Discord said the chatbot will be able to send gifts to channels, create new chat threads, and recommend music. It will not be able to draft messages. It will not be chatting with you using chat GPT. Not yet. The test will roll out to a very small group of alpha testers, so not everybody's going to be using it either. Discord also began testing opt-in conversation summaries and a new version of Automod. Ars Technica sources say that Apple and manufacturing partner Foxconn successfully convinced the Indian government to change labor laws in the state of Karnataka last month. This means that Karnataka will now allow 12-hour shifts. That's up from the previous limit of nine hours. This is similar to how the companies already operate in China. But of course, Apple and Foxconn are trying to expand. Karnataka also eased rules on nighttime work for women. And the new legislation caps maximum working hours at 45 hours per week, but also raised the number of allowable overtime hours to 145 over a three-month period, which is up from 75. Pretty significant. Everybody I know who's in the know has been telling me not to freak out about OpenAI's GPT-3. They say, no, wait to freak out until GPT-4 gets here. GPT-4 is going to blow your mind. <laughs> well... We're gonna uh, we're gonna get our chance soon. Microsoft's Germany CTO Andreas Braun told folks at the AI in Focus Digital Kickoff event, "quote We will introduce GPT-4 next week. We will have multimodal models that will offer completely different possibilities. For example, videos. Multimodal models can interact through text images, sounds, and videos. So you can do things like create a video from a text prompt. Uh huh." The model will also generate answers faster and make them sound more human. Uh, Braun did not say which Microsoft products might receive this update. WhatsApp head Will Cathcart said that Meta would stop offering the messaging app in the UK if it, it was forced to weaken its encryption due to the UK online safety bill. As written, the bill doesn't require weakening encryption directly, mm. but it does require companies to use accredited technology to scan all messages for child sexual abuse material. Signal president Meredith Whitaker previously said that Signal would also exit the UK market rather than undermine its end-to-end -end encryption. I mean, would Signal and WhatsApp agree? <laughs> I'm just saying. It's significant. All right, bit of a complicated story here, folks. Uh, it probably, all jokes aside, probably won't affect you directly, but this is important background info to know when trying to understand the tech landscape, and it has a chance of impacting things well beyond tech. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank provides banking services to half of U.S. venture-backed tech and life sciences companies. So even though this might not hurt you directly, it might affect a service or a product uh, that is made by a company who banks at Silicon Valley Bank. 
or at least they used to bank at Silicon Valley Bank. Rising interest rates, recession fears, and a slowdown in IPOs caused a lot of startups to start to have to pull out money to pay for stuff. Uh, that meant SVB needed to get some cash to cover those withdrawals. If you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, you understand why, why that happens. Uh, so SVB sold some bonds to raise some instant cash. Except it's a really bad time to sell bonds because of those rising interest rates that I just mentioned. So to make up for that shortfall when they sold the bonds, SVB decided it would sell some common stock. However, rumor was getting out about the shortfall and there was some lack of confidence in the bank. So the share price began to slide, which meant that they were having a hard time on Thursday getting investors to go on board. Why would I buy common stock at that price when it keeps going down? SVB shares fell more than 60% in pre-market trading by Friday. At the same time that's going on, you have a lot of advisors to startups out there going, you know, you might want to just withdraw your funds from SVB to protect them. And that's how you get bank runs. People start fearing the bank will run out of money, withdraw their deposits, causing the bank to run out of money. Uh, SVB started to look at a sale that was reported early on Friday, but before that could even happen, the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation stepped in and closed Silicon Valley Bank and put the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Com Corporation in charge, the FDIC. FDIC says it will reopen SVB branch locations Monday and start giving depositors access to their accounts. Now, FDIC insures deposits up to $250,000 per depositor. However, as The Verge notes, according to a recent 10K filing, more than 90% of SVB's deposits were larger than that limit. Now, SVB has a lot more than just $250,000 per deposit on hand, so they can cover more than the minimum, but there's no definitive word on how these larger accounts are going to be impacted. Uh, they will get an advanced dividend paid within the next week. But all this makes me wonder, how are startups going to pay for stuff? Because startups, especially with payroll coming up on March 15th, probably have a good chance of having more than $250,000 in expenses this week. Oh man. So, okay. So I did, I did sort of a crash course in finance this morning, uh, you know, because <laughs> both the, you and me both. The, the Silicon Valley bank story has, has uh, twisted and turned quite a bit over a very short period of time. You know, my, you know, my, my first question, because I know some folks who work in startup land, um, you don't have to be a startup to work with SVB, but, um, but but they do and i was like what like why this bank you know why why have so many you know tech startups decided to go with this bank over another bank is there some you know advantageous reason that i'm not understanding i understand you know the bond thing but like you could do that with pretty much any bank right mm -hmm. you know if you're in the sector and you know i was told that well, you know, it, it, uh, it's been around since 1983. It is very, you know, uh, you know, startup friendly. There are a lot of perks that you might get, you know, you might get some better rates for dealing with the bank. Um, you might, the bank may, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, sponsor some cool trip where, you know, you know, everybody gets a free plane ride, you know, to mm -hmm. go to the space and talk more about banking. Yeah. Type thing. It's startup friendly. It speaks their language. Sounds like very much. So that said, as soon as things go south, people are like, Ooh, okay. Whoa. Goodness gracious. Now the FDIC saying that in, uh, depo insured deposits up to $250,000, you know, they're safe. I've also heard, you know, from folks like, oh, well, we have more than that in there. Yeah. So what do we do now? And I think that's a little unclear. And that's where some of the panic has been coming in. So usually what happens in this kind of situation is the FDIC sells off the company that the, the, the most comparable second largest bank failure in U.S. history was in 2008. Washington Mutual was eventually sold to J.P. Morgan Chase. And those sale proceeds were used to make large depositors whole. Uh, it sounds like that's what they're going to do. 
They're going to do what they're going to use whatever funds are available to. And that's why they stepped in and shut things down. So the losses didn't continue. Uh, they're going to use what funds are available to make startups whole uh, as much as they can and, 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 and hopefully keep them running. And then they'll probably sell Silicon Valley Bank to someone else and use those sale funds to pay out the larger depositors. Uh, but it's all up in the air right now. Uh, and most Wall Street analysts think that this is unlikely to spread to the broader banking system, but shares of a lot of midsize and regional banks have suffered on Friday. Sometimes that's just reputational stuff and it goes away by next week, but it kind of makes you nervous, right? Yeah. I mean, make, uh, <laughs> I have no skin in the game, <laughs> quite literally, <laughs> but uh, but it makes me nervous, um, especially because the story has changed so much over a very short period of time where people were like, whoa, yesterday we heard, you know, the LP saying, we're good, SVB is good, we're good. everyone's going to figure it out. And then today it's like, yeah. Ooh, whoops. Well, they okay. were good. I mean, I, I I buy that. I buy that they oh, were yeah, good. Oh, yeah, I don't think it was a uh, lie. This is one of those fast-changing situations where yeah. uh, they they didn't think this was going to be a problem. It's the kind of problem that isn't a problem unless people believe it's a problem. And there was a lot of whispering behind the scenes that caused it to become a problem. Because instead of, if, if no one had known... They would have they would have sold those shares. They would have covered the bond shortage and, and everything would have been fine. But because everybody panicked and started withdrawing more deposits, that caused the shares to go down. And when the shares go down, they couldn't sell the shares to make up the money. And that you just have a cascade. Like you say, it, it moved really fast. Indeed. It's a, it's a domino's effect. The closest I've been to something like this is I worked at a bank in 2008. And when the reception, recession was happening, I was watching consumers come into the bank and take out all the cash that they could from their yeah. accounts. But and, and our safe was empty. Like we had to order more money from the FDIC. But luckily, <laughs> the FDIC covered it and we were able to purchase more money to put in our safe to yeah. cover those withdrawals. The money's but, not here. <laughs> Nobody that well, I saw I think, had I think, over 250k, and if they did, as yeah, consumers, at a consumer they bank, were they usually separating wouldn't. that money yeah. into different banks right. so that all of it was insured. You know, and Shannon, you probably know more about this than any of us, having worked at a bank. But I think a lot of people don't realize it's like my money's in the bank, my money is safe, right? <laughs> my money is there yeah. physically no, the way, the way somewhere. Banks, well, <laughs> And it the turns way banks, out not yeah. always the case. The yeah, way banks work, exactly. and this is this is not this is not shady. The way banks work is they take your money and they loan it out to somebody else. Exactly. So the money doesn't sit there. But as long as everybody doesn't need all their money at once, it works fine. Every bank works like that. And they have a certain amount of deposits on hand to cover a reasonable amount of increased demand. That that In fact, that's one of the rules that came along after 2008 is making that pile a little bigger to oversimplify things. Uh, but if everybody starts coming in and wanting their deposits then out, it's a, then it's, yeah, then you because get this. This, is, this is unusual behavior. And then yeah. the bank goes, oh, <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, because everybody they loaned it to isn't going to pay their loan back immediately. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so you got a mismatch. All right. Well, moving on. On Thursday, money control sources say that Meta was working on an app codenamed P92 that would let folks use their Instagram login to access an app for text updates. Kind of sounds similar to Twitter or Mastodon. The app would support ActivityPub, the web standard used by Mastodon specifically. Meta confirmed the plan for a standalone decentralized social network to money control and also a platformer that's run by Casey Newton. Now, back in December, Tech Dirt's Mike Masnick talked about ActivityPub needing its Gmail moment to catch on. Gmail meaning when is the moment that we're all going to say, aha, this is, this is the way. We've got Flipboard, we've got Mozilla, we've got Medium, all starting Mastodon incidences incidences and tumblr and Flickr and now meta are in the offering so are we at the moment maybe the there there won't be an actual moment i don't think mike mazdick thinks there there will be like a moment but there there will be a moment when we realize that we've passed the moment right and if instagram were to suddenly say we've got a mastodon server use your instagram to log in I mean, Shannon, don't you think a bunch of people would start using Mastodon that were not interested before? This 
this actually makes it sound a lot more user friendly because people don't have to like create brand new logins to be able to access this kind of information. So in a sense, I could see this being adopted a lot more faster now because people don't have to think about, you know, anything brand new. They could just log in with their Instagram login and be right there and ready to go. So yeah, it's, it's very intriguing. As somebody who has watched Mastodon grow from like 2015, this is very intriguing. I, it starts to make me wonder about Blue Sky. And Blue Sky uses a different protocol. They don't yeah. use ActivityPub. They use the AT protocol because they think it's better. It's ActivityPub is to RSS what the AT protocol is to Adam, if you know your feed lingo. But basically, <laughs> ActivityPub is just an older one that doesn't do a couple of things better. And so AT was designed to be like, oh, those things that are annoying with ActivityPub will design this not to have those. So then the question becomes, is Blue Sky going to stay on that AT protocol and be a competing platform and be interesting? Because everybody who talks about Blue Sky thinks it's a really interesting Mastodon competitor. Or is Blue Sky, is you know, if if Instagram's doing this, if Mozilla's doing this, is Blue Sky going to go, eh, maybe we support ActivityPub after all? I'm very curious about that part of this, too. I mean, the underlying technology is important, but I I, I really... I really wonder, you know, how we're going to be with all these companies trying this out, saying, you know, let's see if we can get a community talking to each other, you know, it, you know, using, you know, whatever platform we decide on, but is is sort of like an offshoot of the platform itself. You know, if you're hanging out on Medium a lot, okay, Medium says, yeah. we're going to, you know, throw you some, you know, <laughs> throw you a bone and, you know, you get access to like a Mastodon server that is in a perfect world, like the cooler one, you know, like that's the one that you wanted the whole time or you wouldn't be paying for Medium. Um, and you got Tumblr, you got Flickr, you've got Meta. You know, how do these all differ? I mean, Google's going to make one. Google's going to... Mark, well, mark my totally, words. Everyone's yeah. going to gonna try this. Yeah. Make no mistake. But how does the... And maybe does this, you know, in this sort of post-order world, which, which we're not in yet, but like, does it make more sense for us to silo ourselves off and just kind of chat amongst ourselves in ways where we're like... We have common ground. I don't have common ground with most people on Twitter, but I'm just used to it. Maybe there's a new way to do this. But but Mastodon doesn't silo you off. That's the that's the beauty of it, right? You can be on that cool medium server if you think it's cool and still see every other Mastodon server. Hundred percent. So you get the best of both worlds. 100%, and I think that's what yeah. that and that's really interesting to see Meta start to realize, well, wait a minute. If we know Facebook is a dying business, if we're having a hard time keeping people on Instagram from TikTok, what if we give them something else that makes them want to stay? And that thing is free and open and interoperable. I mean, that that's how this kind of thing starts to happen. And I think it's very interesting to watch Twitter blow its lead. Right now, Twitter, it's not that Instagram wants to bring down Twitter by starting something like this. It's not that Mozilla does. It's not that, that, that anyone really wants to bring down Twitter. It's that Twitter has ceded its ground. The yeah. reason Mastodon didn't take out over before is everybody's like, yeah, but Twitter's great. Twitter not being as great has given this the space for this to happen. Indeed. All right, folks, uh, if you have a thought about that or anything else we talk about on the show, here is our email address. You can use your electronic mail provider to send us a message, uh, much like a Mastodon address. You would type feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Last week, we talked to Rod Simmons about password managers and things to keep in mind when using them. Uh, one of the things we talked about was multi-factor authentication. Uh, Rod talked about all of the hardware authentication devices he has, like YubiKey. And after that episode, Kyle sent us an email asking, are physical dongles, like the YubiKey, for 2FA really better for security than a 2FA app? So with Shannon coming on the show, we thought, well, let's ask her. Uh, Shannon, what do you think? 
Uh, yes, TLDR, yes. The show is over. Bye, everybody. <laughs> okay, thanks, everyone. <laughs> have a good day. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Hold on. I do have one quick question. Why? <laughs> Why are they <laughs> Oh, man. Um, there, are, there are a lot of reasons, but I think the main one is just understanding that there have been a lot of attacks on two-factor authentication in the past year. Um, we have seen reports from Uber and Cloudflare and uh, most recently, I believe Reddit was attacked and they were the attacker was able to steal their 2FA codes. So we know that there are ways that attackers can bypass two-factor authentication. So how do you harden that for your own online accounts? And even though these attacks were hitting big companies with like hundreds or thousands of employees, the same exact kind of attacks have been used against consumers. And we have often seen this even on like YouTube for YouTube channels. Like you could have like one person who's running this YouTube channel at 500,000 subscribers, their 2FA code gets stolen in some way. And then a hacker is able to get in and steal their account and start like posting live streams. So it's really important to understand why hardware keys are better since these attacks are happening more more currently, like more op often in the past year. So it's not that the apps themselves are weak. Like it's not that Authy or Google right. Authenticator are weak. Uh, as I understand it, it's that because you have to type the code in, it gives an opportunity for someone to steal that code as you're typing it in. Is that right? Yes, 100%. So with, with uh, hardware keys, all you have is one of these little keys. If you're watching on video, I have one in front of me right here. You plug this into your computer. You tap on a little gold uh, piece of metal on the side of it to show that you're physically there. And then it lets you log in. It's like magic. You don't have to type anything in. You just plug this thing in. Or if you're using an NFC enabled device, you just tap it on the back of your phone. And as soon as it registers that it's there, physically there, then it lets you log in. When you compare that to Google Authenticator, Authy, or any of those, or even SMS texting, those require you to type in something that you see and something that you memorize real fast and then type it into the website as you're logging in. Like my 2FA code is one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. So I have to memorize that and type it in. And then it lets me enter my account. The problem is if you are typing in something that you can physically see, anybody else could physically see it too. So if somebody is standing behind you and they happen to see your 2FA code and somehow maybe they're on the same network and they saw your username and password get wirelessly transmitted to a website, they could type in that 2FA code too on their own computer and be able to log in. Or if somebody makes you click on a link and that link just happens to look exactly like your banking website, but it turns out the domain is slightly off, like they could copy that 2FA code when you type it in and put it into the legitimate website and get access to your bank account, assuming that your bank has 2FA turned on. So there are ways that attackers could bypass or just copy over your six digit code, even if your phone never got hacked, even if you never had your phone number um, uh, SIM swapped, or somebody stole your phone number and was able to download the same Authy or Google Authenticator app on their own phone and copy over those six digit keys, they could still steal them on the internet as well. So I recommend people upgrade to a hardware key since there are no keys. Yeah. But they can no still problem. steal your key, but that becomes harder to do, right? None <laughs> yeah. of these things are perfectly secure. SMS exactly. is out of your control. If they fooled the phone company into switch SIM swapping and giving them access to your text message account, you're done. There's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Authy and the, and the apps are better because they, they can't get them that way. But yeah, is somebody going to look over your shoulder and, and steal your code in 30 seconds? Probably not. But a key logger could and do it automatically and do it really fast. Right. So, you know, it's and yes, somebody could steal your YubiKey and and somehow have your login, but that's even harder. So that to me, it's what you're what you're talking about is the the key isn't perfect, but it is the least likely to be compromised. Right. And websites aren't perfect too. And this is an argument I see often is people will say, well, the, the hardware key is working the same way when I plug it into X website. Uh, I'll use LastPass as an example. Mm -hmm. They still use a protocol 
which has been in use for decades. It's called uh, one-time passcodes or mm -hmm. one-time codes. Uh, time, sometimes these are time-based one-time codes. That's what you'll see in apps where it mm -hmm. changes every minute. So you have to type it in within a minute. Sometimes you can plug in a hardware key and it uses that same protocol. So you plug it in and it gives you like a string of digits that you'll see written out and then it lets you log in automatically after you had plugged it in. That is a website issue, not necessarily the key issue. The key mm -hmm. includes that protocol to make it more useful across all your different websites. So you can just use one key to log into all the things instead of an app. What you want to do and what I highly recommend is tell websites that you're you're like you have an account on to upgrade to something called FIDO2 mm -hmm. or FIDO U2F. So that is a newer protocol that just does it's kind of like a public private key pair. It's like a handshake between mm. the website and your key where they authenticate each other. So if you plug in this key into a, uh, um, your login and you're trying to log into a website, let's say the website is a, f a fake one and you're trying to log in there, there's not going to be a handshake because the fake website doesn't know who your key is yeah. and the key doesn't recognize that fake website. So it's going to give you an error. It's not going to let you log in. And that's a sure way to tell that you're trying to log into a fake website. So in that sense, when you upgrade to FIDO2 or when a website upgrades to FIDO2, you end up with a much stronger way of noticing phishing or noticing somebody trying to um, trying to spoof a website and get you to log in because you end up with that error and it doesn't allow you to log in. Yeah. And as Rod mentioned last week, uh, if you do rely on a key, make sure you have at least two of them in yes. different locations. Agreed. So in case you lose or break one, you're not you're not left out in the cold. Yes, agreed. Definitely. And and that's a question I get often whenever I do videos about 2FA and hardware keys is, do I need a different one for every single website? And no, uh, you don't. Like I have 25 accounts on one of my 2FA keys. This is not the one. So if you find my house, if you steal this, it's not connected to anything. This is just my <laughs> default key for reviews. So in that sense, like you only need one key for all your accounts. And then I highly recommend having the backup keys for all your accounts too, just in case you damage or lose the original. Uh, thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, hopefully this helps uh, Kyle and others kind of understand the the benefits. Not that the apps are bad. It's just, you know, if you the, the safest thing is the key. It's all yeah. It's all about, you know, what level of comfort you have with the risk involved. Well, speaking of levels of comfort, it turns out that uh, people really like vinyl records. Sales of LPs just passed CDs. That's right, people. You heard me right. Vinyl is alive and well. In fact, the RIAA reports that revenue on vinyl sales increased for the 16th consecutive year in 2022. The 16th consecutive year up 17 percent. Vinyl revenue has been bigger than CDs for a few years now because it sells for a higher price, so that's part of it. But for the first time since 1987, vinyl albums unit sales passed CDs, 41 million LPs versus 33 million CDs. Overall physical media accounted for 11 percent of U.S. recorded music revenues in the year. That... I I feel like I need like a bookshelf to display yes. my vinyl because I only have like a few of them and maybe I need but more. I don't know. So like pretty. I want to be cool. They're, they're, so, they're pretty. so pretty. They're so nice. I just this bought is... my first two vinyls ever this year. And really? And I need to find a record player because I, I have the right the records. <laughs> I the found a like, great I've got techniques. the vinyl. Now I need a way to play them. I found a great yeah. techniques record player at Target. One oh. day when I was oh, buying a record, at Target. yeah, um, they, 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 it, it, it's to me, this story says everything, which is, yes, 88 percent of people are streaming the music. Eleven percent are doing recorded, you know, physical media. But it's just nice. It's a nice thing. It's a luxury. Sure. But it's something that's pleasant and it's so much more pleasant to take 
an album out of a sleeve and put it down and put the needle on. And I like the warm sound. I don't even think it's superior sound, but I just like the style of there's, it. It's just, there's the sound. There's something to the experience. And there's, you know, some of my friends who are, you know, kind of more committed to vinyl than I am say, this is the way that you listen to an album front to back. I mean, oh. sure, you can do that other ways, but you're yeah. forced to do that this way. There's something oh, in now in, I know what that phrase means. <laughs> yes, yes. This was before my time, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, uh, it's it's great. I, I I just bought an LP yesterday myself. I pre-ordered one, so uh, yeah. I I think this is not a which is better music or why are you doing that when you can stream. It's it's a it's a matter of taste. It's well, a and of style. and and just a reminder that you know if you. If you're, you know, you're part of some sort of novelty slash, you know, like fun, uh, I don't know, maybe even call it like a fringe movement, uh, the vinyl one has really caught on. Yeah, I, it's not fringe anymore. No. At least not according to these not. numbers. Yeah, you CD yeah. people, you're fringe. Cassettes coming for you, CDs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, bring Len Peralta back in here. He has been busy illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us today, Len? Well, before I get into what I would, what I drew, I just have to, to, to chime in about the LPs. So uh, I teach a graphic design class, and the, the, the assignment I just gave them this week, they have a couple weeks to put together a gatefold vinyl album. Oh, nice. That's a cool assignment. It is a super cool assignment. So they're doing that. They're doing lyric sheets. They're doing sleeves. They're doing everything. It's really, really cool. Um, that's really happy news because uh, I went and I checked uh, my stock holdings and uh, I do have some um, uh, skin in the game and was very kind of upset about what I found when I opened it up. So I closed it very immediately, which led to this piece of art. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Silicon Valley Bank is killing us. Well, not my people who are invested in it, unfortunately. And you know what, Tom, what you said uh, earlier in the show, uh, it's hopefully it will all straighten out next week. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, looking at my portfolio, I hope it does. Yeah, for that, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, it's not a really great time, and hopefully there won't be a um, uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" moment uh, coming up, <laughs> or um, at least it ends happily, like "What's a Wonderful Life" you did. Would, yeah, right. You would hope, or I, it's people uh, at least are able to go what on. What is their, it with uh, S acronyms? SBF, SVB, like <laughs> it's just I don't know. I know. Well, that image, by the way, is over at my uh, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. If you can be back me at the uh, the DTNS lover level, you get it. Or you can go the old-fashioned way and purchase it from my store at lenperaldastore.com, which I am also taking commissions, so think about that as well. Well, Shannon Morris, also great to have you today. Bring in the knowledge about 2FA and everything else. Let folks know where they can keep up with all that you do. So I'm about to hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. Yeah! I'm so excited. Thank you for the applause. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> if, if you if you want to support what I do, if you want to see more security and privacy related content, uh, check out my YouTube channel. Please subscribe and check out the newest videos. Please remember well, us when you pass on the yes, yeah. you know, We were, we knew her when. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Shannon. And thank you, Len. Also, thanks to our brand new boss, Brian. Brian, you just started backing us on Patreon mere moments before we started recording the show. And we see you and we hear you and we thank you, Brian. And the audience gives you the same applause that Shannon got for a hundred thousand on YouTube, right? Like it's yeah. it's a, as big a deal for Brian. Uh, Brian, very generous, too generous. You're the best. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, also, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk more with Shannon about how to choose a specific key. Do you need a YubiKey? We always say like YubiKey, but there are others out there. We're going to talk to her about that. Stick around, patrons like Brian. You can also catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be 2000 UTC when we come back on Monday because That's right. the U.S. in many places is going to daylight savings time. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. But no matter what time zone you're in, we'll be back on Monday with Chris Ashley joining us. Have a great weekend, everybody. Talk to you soon. 
This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, WS Goddess One, BioCal. Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, J.D. Galloway, Mod and Video Hosting by Dan Christensen, Music and Art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta, Live Art performed by Len Peralta, Acast adds support from Tatiana Matias, Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show include Nicole Lee, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Shannon Morse, and Chris Christensen. And and thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>